All right, welcome back to Roundtown Restoration, everybody. In this episode, I'm going to explain how to convert your old British car from incandescent lighting to LED lighting. All right. All right, everybody realizes, especially in the last 20, 30 years, cars have gotten bigger. You got SUVs, large pickup trucks, right? Everything's getting bigger. People want to put more people in stuff, more stuff in stuff. Right, and the cars are getting larger and heavier while more safe for a little British sports car like this that weighs well under a ton you're the little guy out there and it only takes one trip down a busy street to realize how small you are compared to the rest of the flowing traffic so a common upgrade that a lot of people do to be seen better is to convert the incandescent lighting to LED lighting so I'm going to go through how I did that on my Triumph Spitfire and explain to you all the process that needs to go in to convert over so here's everything you need this is to convert brake lights and parking lights, turn signals, all of those things from incandescent lighting to LED lighting. And also I'm going to change over the one bulb that I have in the passenger compartment for the turn signal monitor, the, the thing that flashes to let you know your turn signal is going. I'm not doing headlights in this video, though headlights should be approximately the same. So I've got four sets of lights here. These here are, so they're all Sylvania except for the little guys here. We'll talk about that. For my brake lights, I'm using Sylvania 1157 red. These are dual element lights or dual LED lights. One for the tail light and one for the brake light when you, when you hit it. Two other Sylvanias, these are 1156. These are both white and those are for the front parking and front turn signals. And the last set is two Sylvania 1156, but these are reds and those are for the rear turn signals. These little guys are, like I said, for the turn signal monitor. This was a four pack. These are essentially the Chinese version, not very expensive. And then I've got a turn signal flasher here. This supports LED bulbs for the Triumph Spitfire. Specifically, this is model number EF-33RL. I'll put links in the description to all this stuff so you can look it all up. The turn signal flasher is probably the trickiest thing if you need to uh, get a new one of those and I'll explain to you why I did so. All of this stuff that you're looking at right here is running runs right about a hundred bucks. The bulbs are anywhere from 20 for the super bright LED ones to about 15 a pair for the the, the other ones and the turn signal flasher was about 12, 13 bucks. These little bulbs here I think were just a couple bucks. So obviously one of the biggest reasons to upgrade the LED bulbs is to be seen better on the road. When you touch the brake lamps, you really want that bright brake lamp so that somebody knows that you're, uh, you're stopping or you're stopped. Turn signals, right? You want those people to see those turn signals, especially on the older cars where the turn signals are very low to the ground. One other thing that you might not realize, on the older cars like this, all of the electricity was run through the switch in question that was supplying the electricity to that particular load. So, for example, the headlights, when you turn the headlights on and the switch in the car, all of that current that runs the headlights runs from the battery of the generator and all the electrical supply system through the switch that's in the, the steering column and out to the headlights. In modern cars, what happens is when you turn that headlight switch on, you just have a little bit of a signal current that runs through that switch, milliamps probably, and then the main current runs out into a relay that's designed to handle heavy current loads like that that can withstand the continuous draw of a large current load to the headlights. So over time, because of the design of the older cars, the switches, which are obviously switching and moving and everything like that, over time you develop some high resistance connections in that switch and you could cause the switch to, to start to melt or overheat or, or eventually become damaged. So converting to LED lights, where it's going to significantly lower the current draw and the current demand that those lights need because they're LEDs, and will reduce the current draw through the particular switch. So fortunately I have a bench power supply and I can show you the difference in results when we do that. So as I said, I've got my bench power supply here. got it set up for 12 volts DC. I've got it connected to essentially the battery cables on the car. And what I'm gonna do is turn just, just the parking lamps on. So that's gonna be four bulbs. You're gonna have your two front parking lamps and your two rear parking lamps. Both of them are, all four of them are identical bulbs. And these are the incandescent bulbs. So this power supply can only put out about 5.1 amps or so. So we'll see what it comes up to when I turn the parking lamps on. All right, so the parking lamps are on and you're looking at about 4.8 amps or so and it's coming down a little bit as the, as the filaments heat up. 
So when we switch everything over to LEDs, we're gonna do the same thing and see what we save. All right, so I said there might be some extra steps depending on how old your car is and how you have it wired up. With my 66 Triumph Spitfire here, it was a positive ground car. When I restored it, I restored it as a positive ground car. So instead of your negative battery terminal going to ground, the positive, positive battery terminal goes to ground. Really not a whole lot of difference in, in the operation of the car. It didn't really impact anything. The, uh, there's a couple drawbacks from that. One, none of your modern electronics will work on a positive ground car. So you can't put a modern radio in it. You can't use a, um, if you have like a, a cigarette lighter adapter or something and you want a USB charging port or something like that, you can't do any of that stuff on a positive ground car. What else you can't do is you can't hook up LED lights. You can find positive ground LED lights, but you pay a premium for them. They're not readily available. They're a little trickier to find. I ordered all this stuff from Amazon, nice and convenient, get it in two days. So what I've decided to do is switch the car over to negative ground and make it conventional. So the next following steps to do that, you won't have to do if you're already on a negative ground car. So if you watch my other videos, I've been restoring my Triumph Spitfire here for four years or so. I just got done actually and put her on the road last week. But uh, I strive to keep everything as original as possible, as original as I could. Kind of went out of my way to try to source original parts when I, when I could. And, uh, and at least re quality reproductions when I couldn't. So the, the question came, might come up is why are you transitioning to LED bulbs when, uh, when everything worked fine and you had everything original? And, and really it hit home about two weeks before I went to get the car registered. A, uh, a post came up on my favorite forum where a gentleman driving his uh, Triumph GT6 essentially got run over by a Ford F-150. He was stopped at a, at a stoplight there was a car vehicle in front of him. The F-150 was coming up behind him for whatever reason, didn't see the Triumph, stopped at the stoplight, rear-ended the, the, uh, the GT6. The GT6 got pushed into the, the car in front of him and stopped. And the, the F-150 kind of went up and over and crushed the guy in the driver's side. His wife was also in the car. I, I believe she was not seriously injured and they had to cut the, the lid off or the, the roof off and everything. And it, the, the gentleman was, was dead at the scene. So anything, you know, that kind of really hit home for me, especially because I was getting close. You know, if this was happened three years ago, maybe it wouldn't have impacted me as much. But I, uh, you know, a lot of the guys that responded to the posts and all that are, are essentially saying you got you to drive your, your little sports car here like you, like you drive a motorcycle. I don't have any motorcycle experience, but I am a, a pretty defensive driver. So anything you can do to, to be seen better on the road. Granted, my bright red paint helps, but anything you can do to be seen better on the road, uh, now in my opinion, I, I'm gonna take advantage of that. So if you're wondering, that's why I'm doing this. So the first thing, obviously, is to switch the battery. Depending on your car, it may just be as simple as picking the battery up, turning it around, and putting it back in and reconnecting your cables. The way that this particular car is designed, the terminal post for the battery should stay to the back. You might have some incidental contact as they get up here. One, you've got the retaining strap here that could touch the, the, the battery, and obviously that would be really bad. And also the way that the bonnet comes down and, and sits, it's pretty low to the battery. And there's been some reports that you can have the bonnet touch the battery post cables. I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to leave the battery the way that it is. And what's that? Instead of having just being able to physically turn the battery around, I have to swap the cables. So 
I have now my negative cable is kind of wrapped in here and it's going to go to the negative terminal and then the positive goes from the starter solenoid which is that silver guy there follows the wire down is it going to go to the bat the uh, the positive terminal why do I worry about that well the positive terminal and the negative terminal are different sizes physically so that you can't put these on backwards and because of that the ends of the cables were also different sizes the connections so I had to physically swap the location of the cables again it depends on how you might need to do that you might get away with like I said just swiping the battery around but uh, but there's nothing nothing really to that alright so I got the schematic for the car here point out a couple things number six here is the battery positive terminal goes to ground so that's how it's originally wired the negative terminal goes throughout the rest of the uh, electrical system number five here is the starter solenoid number four is the starter number one up here that's the control box with the voltage regulator number two is the generator and then way out here the only other thing we're going to talk about number 15 is the coil and number 16 is the distributor so again, because of the way that the car is set up right now, you have a positive ground. So anytime you see these ground taps on all these lights and all that kind of stuff, that's returning to the positive side of the battery. Well, because I have to now switch that and make it the negative side of the battery, now all my returns have to be in the negative. The generator cares. We'll get into that. But the coil cares. And the reason the coil cares is because it's going to depend on how it puts the spark through the spark plug. So spark plugs are designed with the center electrode, that's where the spark comes out and it goes out to the outer electrode to create your spark. Well when you have that hooked up backwards, instead of going from the center electrode which was designed to handle all of the heat, you know the 30,000 degrees or whatever, it is, or 30,000 volts, whatever it is, to generate that spark and all the heat generated from that spark, instead of the center electrode getting it, the outer electrode is going to get all that heat and it's just not designed to do that. So we're going to swap that around. It doesn't really affect the spark too much. If you don't do this, the car will run, but it might run a little bit better, especially under heavy loads when, uh, when you swap this around. Now the coil is polarized. There's a positive and negative lead on the coil. It's not shown here on the schematic. What I need to make sure of is because now the car is going to be negative ground, I'm going to come into the wire in positive and come out with this wire coming out of the negative side of the coil. So right now it's wired such that the positive side comes out of the coil because that's what runs the distributor and that's what runs the what is a positive ground. Well, because I'm going to a negative ground, I got to swap that. So it's a lot of words there, but that's electrically why you want to swap that. All right, so this is the coil. I've already swapped the wires. You can see a little positive sign there, a little negative sign there. So this white wire is that white wire I showed you coming from the fuses that comes into the positive side. And this green wire here, I had to make this wire myself, that's why it's on long and, and gangly there. That is the negative coming out of the negative and goes all the way into the distributor here. So that's done. So that, there's two wires, so this should literally take you seconds. The last thing we need to do to convert the car to negative ground is you got to reflash the field of the generator. So the generator right now is polarized such that it, it supports a positive ground car, so we need to repolarize it such that it converts to a negative ground car. Now this is straightforward to do. There's only two wires that go into the generator. You've got a large brown and yellow wire that's kind of on the top and, it, and it's, it's a large wire. And then you've got a little green and brown wire coming into the bottom and that's your field wire, if you can see that. So that's a normal size wire and that's what you need to flash. So right now I've got the battery hooked up and I've got a jumper connected to my starter solenoid right here, just a little little um, alligator clip and I've got voltage from the battery on that 12 volts and I've got on the other end of that jumper lead is just a bare piece of metal and I'm going to just touch a couple times the metal to the field lead that I just unplugged and you're going to touch it to the spade that's on the generator itself two three times and you should see little little itty bitty sparks and that will polarize the generator and that's that's really all there is to it all right so you can see that spade there and I'm just going to touch it All right, so three sparks. When you do this, you just mo are momentarily touching the, the lead, the jumper to the, to the spade. You don't want to leave it there very long, and that's really all there is to it. So now, electrically, the car should be totally negative ground and set up and ready to run. All right, close up on the speedometer here, down towards the bottom under the NPH, there's three lights. On the left is a blue light, that's for your high beams. The one in the center is a green light, that's for the oil pressure. The one to the red, that's the generator light, and that tells you it's labeled ignition but it tells you whether or not the battery is charging. So now that I've reflashed the field, I want to make sure 
that the generator is actually charging the battery. So I'll turn the ignition on here. You'll see the two lights, the, the green oil lamp and the red generator light light up and then I'll start the car and then that generator lamp hopefully the green lamp goes out right away or got problems the generator lamp should become dim and as the car runs a little bit faster it should extinguish and go out completely and that tells me that the generator is charging the battery and that I've reflashed the field properly and successfully if not I gotta go back and reflash it again so hopefully I'll get it the first time here So you can see that that generator light did go out. All right, so the generator light did go out. Now it, it um, doesn't charge the battery at, at uh, anything less than about 1,000 RPM, but you can see once it got up there, it did go out. So I know that I've successfully flashed the field and the generator works. All right, so now after all that, finally, we can do what we came here to do and swap the bulbs. So I'm gonna go ahead and swap all the parking lamps and the brake lamps. I'm not gonna show you how to do that. It's gonna be slightly different on your car depending on how it's set up and everything. Probably all about the same, just a couple screws. And uh, I'll go ahead and put all the incandescent, or excuse me, remove all the incandescent bulbs and put in all the LED bulbs. So obviously one of the goals here is to get brighter. So what I've got set up here is in this uh, highly scientific contraption is my cell phone with a free app luminosity meter or a lux meter. I don't know, you know this is definitely not going to be a quantitative measurement. It's going to be a qualitative measurement. It should be able to give me a, a, a big flick on this. So I've got it two feet away and directly facing my front parking lamp on my driver's side. Right now it's reading about 30 lux which is the lights are off in the garage, but I've got my work lamp on just to have a baseline here. So again, 30 lux, the light is off. I'm gonna turn it on and see what, uh, what it comes up to. So it looks like we're looking at about 136 or so, 136 lux, and again, that's two feet away, directly facing it, and that's, um, that's it. So now we'll go ahead, we'll swap that bulb out and we'll put the LED bulb in there and see if I get any difference. All right, we have the bulbs changed out. Now I did change all of the LED parking lamps out the, um, with the incandescence in there in some spots. Since the LEDs draw such, such little current, the, um, the incandescents kind of want to steal it all. So you may very well replace, just try to replace one bulb and then turn your light on and it doesn't come on at all. So just be prepared for that if you don't. You know, you go to test and you don't see anything. You have to essentially change out all the lights on that on that string. So looking at about 25 lux again right now. I got the lights out. Like I said, same same initial setup. I'm gonna drop it to 13 a little bit. So we'll go ahead and turn the parking lamps on. And uh, yeah, not not anywhere near as good. Only about 36 coming from 13. And uh, flash the 40 there for a second. So not uh, not that much of a difference between off and on. So that's that's not what I was expecting, but the light is much bright, much crisper, much more white. So we'll continue on and we'll see how, uh, how the turn signals end up. So as I said earlier, another potential advantage here is the current draw that's gonna go through the switch with the LEDs being being hopefully less than what you're looking at for incandescent bulbs. So I've got the power supply hooked up here, I've got nothing on. So I'll go ahead and turn on the parking lamps. And if you remember, we were looking at about, I think it's about 4.8 amps or so. So we'll see what we get now with the four brake lamps hooked up, or excuse me, four parking lamps hooked up. All right, pretty good. We're drawing less than an amp now. So a quarter of the current draw for the LED bulbs as you would expect are now going through that switch and will hopefully contribute to longer switch lifetime.
All right, so I've swapped out all of the turn signals for LEDs and go ahead and show you what happens now without changing out the flasher unit when you try to turn. So the turn signal light comes on, but it just sits there, doesn't do anything. So because the LEDs have such a low current draw, the original flasher units weren't designed for that and they, don't, uh, they can't click, they can't operate properly. So essentially what happens with a flasher unit is as it operates, it, as the current flows through it, it heats up a little bit and it causes a break in contact, cools off, and the, and the piece of metal slaps back and then recreates electrical contact and that's what that clicking noise you hear. Well, because there's no current draw through this thing, there's not enough heat flow or heat generation to cause that bimetallic strip in there to pull away and actually operate. So that's why you need a new flasher. So we'll go ahead and I'll show you how to swap that out. All right, so that silver guy right there, that's the flasher unit. All I'm gonna do is pull that out, put the new one in, and connect the little ground wire that comes off the new flash unit to that screw right there, and then I'll show you that it's gonna flash. All right, so really in just about as much time as it took me to, to blend those two scenes together is about how long it takes to replace that flasher unit. All right, so I got the ignition switch on. Go ahead and hit the flasher. You can hear it clicking, and obviously flashing there. and flashing there, so that works. Now the question is, what color bulb did I put back there? Well, time for a science lesson. All right, I got the camera suspended from the ceiling here, so this might be a little dicey. But there's a little eyeball here, and what you see in the center there is all of the visible light spectrum. So if you've got a light bulb over here, given that light, it's gonna give out white light and the way that light works and the way that we see it is white light is the presence of all of these colors of light, all of those smashed together and combined provide us white light. So that's why when you see a rainbow, when there's moisture in the air through the sunlight, that moisture, the little water droplets kind of split the light out into components, component parts and you see all those different colors of the rainbow. That's how an incandescent bulb works. So when you have an incandescent bulb, behind a red lens, what the red lens does is essentially filter out all of the light with the exception of the red light. Now all of these, you can see that I've got these lines are kind of squiggly to kind of represent waves, light travels in waves, and the frequency of these waves is just a little bit different for all the different colors. So when you are looking at a color, say you're looking at somebody's shirt and somebody's shirt is blue, that fabric and all the stuff that goes into it absorbs all of the light with the exception of that along the blue spectrum. So what it reflects is the blue color and that's what you see as blue light and color. So color and light are kind of closely related. So when I put this white bulb with all of these component parts of colors, and I put them all behind a red lens, the only light that gets out is red. Probably a little bit orange in there, but the vast majority that you get out is red. So that's why you need a lens for a regular incandescent bulb. You need a red lens to get red light. LED bulbs, totally different. LED bulbs do not produce white light. That's not, right, LED is electronic, so it's digital, right? It can only produce one of these wavelengths at a time. So you can have LEDs that produce all of these different wavelengths, but you can't have a single LED produce them all at the same time to give you a red light, or excuse me, to give you a white light. So then you ask, well, I got all sorts of white LEDs. They're all over my house. How do they do that? Well, the vast majority of them put out blue light and then coated on top of the LED is phosphorus, some, some element of phosphor that causes the blue light strikes that and when it reflects off of that phosphor it looks white to our eyes. So if you remember back in the day when LEDs were, were a relatively new thing, the white LEDs were not that great and they had all this blue tinge to it. It looked very fake and very like a, I know it turned a lot of people off and you can even see that now. Some of the headlights they look very blue and that's because that's, uh, that's what's going on there. So LEDs cannot produce pure white light, 
by themselves. When I've got an LED to put behind a lens, if I have a white LED, like I said, the vast majority of that light coming through that LED is blue, and then the rest of it is white from the phosphors that produce it. So if I have an LED bulb, it's going to produce quite a bit of blue light, and then all the other light components like we have, and if I put it behind a red lens, the blue is going to be blocked, all the other color spectrums are going to be blocked, and you're going to get just a little bit of red out from where that phosphor coating produced visible white light. So you're losing all of these other light streams, all of those other light frequencies, and therefore reducing the overall intensity of the light. So what you get out when you put a red, or excuse me, a white bulb behind a red lens, LED wise, you're going to end up with a lower luminosity, a lower lux, a lower intensity coming out on the other side of the lens. If instead I have an LED bulb behind a red lens and all this LED is doing is putting out red light, that lens is going to pass that red light with no problem and it's going to be almost invisible to that red wavelength and you're going to pass all of that red light. All right, I almost forgot this, uh, that little dot that's in the center in between the tack and the speedometer. That's the, that uh, turn signal monitor I was talking about. When I turn the turn signal on, you can see that flashes. It's not really all that bright. So I'm going to put one of those screw-in LED bulbs, the little cheapo guys that I picked up, and see if it works. I don't even know if it will. Bulb's been replaced. Let's see. Oh, yeah. That's a lot brighter. I like that a lot better because now I can kind of see it and know, even though I've got that the louder click noise, I can definitely see that. I do not intend to replace the instrument gauge bulbs, however, just because I kind of like that more subdued incandescent look for that. All right, so we got all the lights out. Obviously, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the parking lamps on. All right, you can see that. And I would say the intensity is about the same. It may be just a touch brighter for the LED bulb, which is on your left, the driver's side. Um, but not, uh, but not much. But I tell you, it looks, it looks a little crisper coming out of the lens, and, I, and maybe that's that wavelength science stuff that I was talking about. Not real sure. Now I'll go ahead and hit the parking or the uh, the brake lamps. So that's the brake lamp, and you can see, I think, the delay in the incandescent bulb. So that's that's obvious, but I. I think the intensity is probably about the same. Now I can't see it because I'm, you know, pressing the brake lamp. But I, my guess was the intensity wasn't a whole lot different there. I did check the rotation of the windshield wiper motor and it remained the same. So I didn't have to worry about flopping around my uh, windshield wiper arms. But there are different designs out there, so obviously you, uh, your mileage may vary. All right, so that's how you transition your classic car from incandescent bulbs to LED bulbs. It took me about uh, two hours, two and a half hours or so com completely. I had nothing done when I came in this morning and I've been, you know, filming it and, uh, and all that stuff. So that sucked up a little bit of time. So definitely something you can do in a morning or an afternoon, obviously, as long as you have all your parts. You do have to do some research to make sure that you can go from the equivalent bulb that you had from the original, you know, your original manufacturer to what the numbers are in, uh, in current LED numbers. But that, that's easy to do. There's all sorts of cross-references all over the Internet. So... I'm not quite as thrilled with the intensity of the front parking lamps as I am with the rear. Uh, the, the response time of the LED is much crisper and much sharper and much quicker. So that, that helps you. As soon as you touch that brake light, that, that LED bulb comes on at full intensity. I think that's important. But otherwise, worth it to me. About 100 bucks, I think. That included all the bulbs and the turn signal flasher. So delivered from Amazon. You know, Amazon, you place the order and they're knocking on your door 15 minutes later. So you can have this stuff pretty quick and uh, it's pretty easy to do. So hopefully uh, you'll look into it, take advantage of it, and uh, get her done. Thanks for watching. Cheers.